another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Thomas J. Williams, who is in lovely Scottsdale, Arizona. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing great, John. How are you today? I am doing excellent. And Tom is from a company called Strategic Dynamics and has a long track record of experience in, uh, in sales and has lately um, authored or co-authored this book with uh, his colleague, another Thomas, Thomas saying, the sellers challenge how top sellers master 10 deal killing obstacles in B2B sales. So before we start, uh, Tom, give me an idea of the genesis of this book and how it came about. Well, John, it, the, the genesis are really kind of interesting. Uh, Tom Sane and I have been working um, with clients for the last 17 years, delivering uh, sales methodology programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting, as we delivered those programs, the one common uh, denominator that occurred all the time is over lunch, over dinner, many times uh, during drinks in the evening with people, they would say, you know, I really like this methodology, but I've got this specific problem. Can you help me with it? Mm -hmm. And so what we started to do is to one day over lunch, Tom and I sat down and we started listing out all the most common challenges that we were being asked by participants and all these different programs and that weren't really being answered, you know, in the traditional sales training programs. So we made a list of them. Then we started to talk about how could we go and develop a book about it. As we looked around the industry, John, it was kind of interesting. Most of the books were around sales coaching, sure. around negotiation, they're around specific methodology, but nobody was really focused directly on what are the specific challenges the sales reps are faced with day in and day out. So that's how we get started. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with you. I think uh, there, there's a huge need for these more, you know, practical um, uh, books that get into the nitty gritty as opposed to theoretical, which, you know, sometimes uh, a lot of them tend to be. I, I thought it was interesting in, in your first one that you cover in your first chapter. I find that very interesting selling to multiple buyers because um, when I'm putting on my pipeline or CRM hat for a moment. We built this capability into our system this, to be able to build not just org charts, but buying centers where you could link. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of salespeople miss. You know, they don't really, you know, map out who is influencing the purchase and they tend to always let's, you know, let's find the decision maker, but not really map out the ecosystem around them, right? Yeah, that, and that's really the genesis of that chapter, John, is to try to get people to think, think differently. It was interesting, as we would develop, uh, do methodology programs, or do, actually, when we would actually either teach the program or when we would do what I'll call must-win deal reviews. Mm -hmm. you know the number one issue that we found with most, sale, most salespeople, failure to identify a key buying influence or stakeholder that was involved in the sale. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the, one of the key aspects of what we wanted to cover in that chapter was that overcome that obstacle. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, realize that different people have you know, different stakes in a, in a sales process. And some of them may be minor, some of them may be major. But if you don't identify them, then you're really just saying you're giving the same message to each one instead of giving a custom message, right? Exactly. And that's, and that's the key is identifying all those different, different stakeholders involved, understanding the role that they play, and then aligning what your value proposition is to that specific stakeholder and what interests them. Yeah, because we've all been in that situation where, you know, maybe we put all the focus on the executive vice president or the CEO, without realizing that it's actually somebody that on an org chart, sits lower, but they're actually the one with the biggest influence on the purchase. Well, it's interesting you say that, John, because, you know, uh, a lot of the work that I do because of my background is in healthcare, mm -hmm. and it's not uncommon to find one or two really interesting people that have got a high degree of influence that are our users, that are people that are actually using the product. And yet when you go to a vice president or you go to a director, they want that person involved because that they, they know that if they evaluate that product, they'll either find something that was wrong with it mm -hmm. or they'll find all the reasons why they should be using it. But yet you would never find them on the organizational chart. It's that informal, if you will, influence that that individual has. But if you don't ask the right questions, you never uncover that individual. Absolutely. And another chapter, um, and I think this is, a, this is a great one just because I think it, it obviously resonates with every salesperson, selling to resistant buyers because I think – 
I mean, nowadays, maybe buyers come across as being even more resistant than they used to be just because, let's face it, they're more armed with more information. And maybe, you know, we all feel like we're bombarded emails, phone calls, LinkedIn emails, I'm getting, you know, phone messages, now text messages from salespeople. So maybe we're all a little bit, even a little bit more resistant. So how do you, how does a salesperson really overcome that? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting uh, interesting uh, issue, John. I think a couple things is we really um, we cover that chapter and we talk about it and overcoming status quo. Uh, and I think part of it is is understanding what what are the causes of status quo, and understanding you know how do I go about getting by that you know. And one of the things that we talk a lot about is using insight selling. We talk a lot about you know the value of stories and how you can use storytelling to uh, to get people's attention to change their perception about what, where they think today and to see something in the future, see a different state, if you will. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Storytelling is one way to do it. There's some, you can do it with facts and figures. You can do it with some specific numbers. Uh, but we walk through the different, different aspects of how to go about doing that and the importance of doing it and showing contrast. Visuals are extremely important way of doing that, John. Because mm -hmm. it's funny because... Um, you know, take the status quo, right? Uh, you know, people are, you know, get dissatisfied with the status quo and then start to reach out maybe and start looking at solutions. But then the minute you bring a solution that suggests some change, suddenly status quo looks really good to them. So you, uh, what you're saying is you have to really use um, whatever's appropriate storytelling facts, whatever, to kind of move them out of that comfort zone that status quo has suddenly become, right? Yeah, you've got to make it relatively uncomfortable to stay where they are and to show them that there's a better state, a better position they could be at. And then, I mean, another um, chapter here that you're, that's really kind of interesting, me, interesting to me is the gatekeeper, right? Uh, because again, like I said, we're all bombarded nowadays and we've all built all of these fences and made it really hard to get at us. And, you know, we leverage gatekeepers, whether they're people or electronic, whatever. We've made ourselves hard to get to. So how do you sell, as you say, selling in a gatekeeper's world? How do you do that? Well, you know, it's interesting, John, the, uh, when you look at that gatekeeper, the first thing we do is to try to get people to think uh, differently about the gatekeeper. And, and one of the things we say is eliminate that word gatekeeper from your vernacular, you know, and think of them as vice presidents of, of access or vice president of talent and think of them in a positive way as opposed to a negative way. The second thing is, is to really get people to think about wh why, are they, why are they trying to block you? Are they really trying to block you or are they trying to protect that executive's time? Whoever it is that you're trying to reach, whether it's an executive, a department head, a manager, a director, whoever it happens to be, you know, their job is to keep, keep people out. Their job is also to let the right people in. And so the question is, is, are you articulating a value message to that individual that says you are important? There's a reason that you're so important that they, they should give you access. And if you think about it in a positive way as opposed to a negative way, uh, it, changes the, it changes the message of what you deliver. Yeah, I love that, what you've just articulated there, because I think that's a really important takeaway for people. And you're correct. We always think of gatekeepers in the negative as keeping people out. But I love that idea of they're also there to let the right person in. So if you're not getting in, then perhaps you need to look at yourself and say, I haven't, articul I haven't been able to present myself as the right person. Yeah, it's interesting, John. A lot of the programs we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, somebody will say, well, you can't get to the C-suite. And I'll say, well, I can tell you, I can tell you five or 10 clients that I'm dealing with that are getting there, you know, all the time. And, and the question is, what are they doing differently than what you're doing? And mm -hmm. they're looking at the gatekeeper in an entirely different way, but they've also got a different value proposition. There's a reason why somebody wants to talk to them. They've done the research and they've, they've come up with the right, the right questions, the right statements to ask in order to articulate a, a message that it resonates with that gatekeeper or resonates ultimately with the decision maker when they get to them. Yeah, and there's another one here. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm laughing at the, because uh, it's the RFPs one, surviving and winning beauty conf, uh, contests, because let's face it, RFPs and, you know, those bake-offs where, where somebody invites like five different vendors in and you each get half a day or a couple of hours. And I mean, they're so, they can be kind of soul-destroying, 
but there is a strategy to make them successful, right? Right. Oh, there it definitely is. You know, and it's interesting is that, um, you know, we, we talk about that there's four different types of RFPs, you know, first off, you know, there's that, that fair RFP, you know, where um, the specifications and requirements are, are really essential to meet the buyer's organization's needs, you know, and it's a fair because it's intended to, to create a fair footing. But there's also a favorite RFP, you know, one that's written in a way that favors one company over the other. Then there's that, what we call a fake RFP, you know, it's their sat an organization, I'm satisfied with my existing vendor, you know, but I, I have to go and, and satisfy some industry or governmental regulation, so I'll send out an RFP. And then the fourth one is that the forced RFP is really the one that it compels you as a as a supplier to think I'm going to lose the business. I've got to do, I've got to go and drop my price. Mm -hmm. So we try to, we, we start with that fundamental tenet of the, making sure that people recognize that there's four different types of RFPs and then walk through the process of how do you, how do you look at, do you have a fighting chance to win this one? And, and one, and also not to be afraid to walk away, Yeah, but do it in the right way. And we actually give you an email in there and a way to go, walk away from that at RFP in a positive way so that you're positioned to come back again to that, to that client. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea because it's one of the things that at a, at a, when I was, we were talking about uh, the company I was at uh, before this Huthway, we actually started this process of when, when we received an RFP, I actually sent a letter back to the person to say how grateful we were um, to be included on it. However, in our experience, if we didn't have a chance to discuss the RFP in advance and to really dig into what it was about, we found that we weren't able to put our best foot forward and it wasn't valuable for the client and ourselves. And it's amazing how often that gave us access to people that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Exactly. Yeah, we agree with you whole, wholeheartedly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so how do you tell people, how do, how do people figure out whether it's a fair RFP or, an, or, a, uh, or a slanted one? Well, I think, you know, you look at, I think you have to look very detailed at what the requirements are and really ask yourself, you know, a couple of questions. One is, um, uh, did they ask the right questions? Mm -hmm. um, is, the, is the questions they are asking, are they slanted one way or another toward one of your competitors? Is there specific language in that RFP that would say, say to you, you know, I think the RFP was written by X, Y, or Z. But there's signals in there as to whether or not it was, it was really fair or, or, or whether it's, a, uh, it's leaning toward one specific uh, provider. Okay, the last piece I'd like to talk about uh, before our time runs out here is I love this, frenemies, partnering with procurement. If there's something that makes people break out in a, in, in a worse cold sweat than an RFP, it's, oh no, procurement. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we've done a lot of work with procurement, and it's interesting, John, when you um, um, when you talk. I mean, most I think most most sales representatives uh, fear procurement, mm -hmm. and part of it is because they believe all they want to do is drop them, drive them down in yeah. price. And I, you know, one of the things that's important to understand about procurement is a they're just trying to do their job. Mm -hmm. You know, their job is to drive down the price. That's how they get compensated. You know, in many organizations, there's a bonus. To the procurement people, if they look at the metrics that they, the procurement has, there's an actual bonus for the number of dollars saved that they have over the previous year's purchase. So there's an incentive for them to drive the price down. But the question is, is they also have internal stakeholders that they must satisfy. So part of the issue is, is for salespeople is to understand is, do you have a commodity product where they're going to drive the price down, or do you have a differentiated product where you have a fighting chance of getting your either your full price or a, re, a reasonably good price. So one of the things we do in there is we, we, um, we provide a four quadrant matrix where we ask people to think about the impact on financial results on one axis and on the other axis, the supply risk. In other words, the risk that procurement has to not be able to provide the products to their internal stakeholder. There's four quadrants. And if you're in the upper right-hand corner of the quadrant, You've got a highly differentiated product. Maybe it's patented. Uh, maybe it's the only product that's available in the market. Guess what? They want to partner with you. They need that product. You're going to get your full price. Uh, you know, and, and if you're in one of the other quadrants, you're going to be in a dogfight. So part of understanding of where you are before you go in and negotiate is extremely important. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, in, instead of just uh, you know, freak out every time procure, 
procurement raises its, uh, its lovely head. Um, make sure that you understand where you sit in the marketplace and where you sit in, in relation to other products. I think that's a great piece of advice. Well, and the other thing, John, is, you know, I think people have to be able to recognize that um, you have to negotiate tough with procurement. You mm -hmm. know, too, many, too often people say, well, they don't, you know, I have to cave on price. And, you know, they have to ask themselves the question is, wh what are the choices? What are the alternatives that procurement has? Right. And again, if you go back to those four quadrants, it, mm -hmm. puts you, it gives you a perspective of, do they have a lot of options or do they not? Yeah. Oftentimes, you're, they're just testing you. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of procurement people I've talked to that said, you know, I just throw it out there that I got to have a 5% <laughs> uh, reduction and somebody says, I'll give it to you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I can believe it. Absolutely. And uh, you can't blame them for asking, right? That's their job. Absolutely. Um, and, and so kind of a lot of it comes down to, as you say, you have to understand where you sit, but you also have to have some confidence in your own, you know, your own product or service. And you also have to be able to walk away if it gets too much, right? You absolutely have to, John. And that, that becomes part of your negotiation strategy. You know, one of the things that, you know, we point out in the book, and I think it's intuitively obvious to every sales professional is, is if you have a highly complex sale, think about the number of times you negotiate with procurement on a monthly basis or a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. And it might be two times a month, let's maybe say it 24 times a year. Procurement's negotiating with you and your competitors six, eight, 10 times a day. Who do you think is gonna win that battle if you don't go in prepared for that negotiation? If you just walk in and say, you know, you know and, and want to think you're gonna walk through the process very quickly and very easily, they're going to eat your lunch. <laughs> I think that's a great point. It's like being a, a casual boxer who trains maybe once or twice a, a week, maybe one, you know, and walks into the ring with a professional. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to go well. <laughs> it's not going to go well. No, not at all. Not at all. Well, listen, thanks, Tom. So the book is uh, The Seller's Challenge, How Top Sellers Master 10 Deal-Killing Obstacles in B2B Sales. It was released on September 6th of this year. I highly recommend you check it out. It'll be in the sales pop uh, library uh, and available obviously on uh, Amazon and all other good booksellers. So Tom, uh, in the last few moments, how can people find out more about you and your organization? Uh, John, thanks for asking. Uh, first off, they can go to uh, my email is twilliams at strategic dynamics with an S firm.com or they can go to our website www.strategicdynamicsfirm.com and I'm also open, always open to uh, LinkedIn uh, invitations. I love to connect with people and talk with them and uh, build relationships. Yeah, and as I said at the outset, I mean, I love the fact that this is a book that has really practical advice in it, things that you can use immediately. It's not a, it's not a theoretical or ethereal book. It's very uh, practical. So again, thanks, Tom. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon.